Who's excited to be in the house of God this morning? Oh, come on, somebody. It's going to be good. I know what a lot of you are thinking. Pastor Ash, have you lost weight? The answer is yes. Thank you for noticing. No, I did get my hair cut. My wife said she was sick of the long hair, and I was like, all right, get ready for the blonde hair then. <laughs> this is what it is. What an honor it is to be with you all this morning. I know I say that every single week and every time I preach, but honestly, I do mean it. I love and appreciate both this house and all of you. But we're in our legacy series, talking about leaving a lasting legacy, a legacy that goes beyond yourself, that, that enables you uh, who you are and, and what you stand for to continue living even after you pass away. Most people think of legacy in the terms of money or in terms of buildings or in terms of accolades, achievements, and statues, that a big way to leave a legacy is build a big building and have people live in it. Do a great work and get a statue to be immortalized. Those are all legacies, don't get me wrong. But when I analyze the life of Jesus, I see a new type of legacy that he left. A legacy that in my opinion is worth more than any earthly achievement or money. If you could all please just bow your heads and join me in prayers we invite in the power of the Holy Ghost this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the word you gave me. Holy Spirit, I pray that as my mouth opens up, let it be your word that comes out, for your word has the power to heal, to inspire, to transform. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will guide me this sermon and enable me to land on the points I need to land on, and I pray that you'll open up the hearts of those in this crowd that they might hear this word and act upon it. And in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hey, we're gonna have some fun this morning. The title of this message for those taking notes and want to get Chick-fil-A in heaven, that's what happens. So that's the title of my message. It's called, A Stranger is Just a Friend You Haven't Met. A Stranger is Just a Friend You Haven't Met. Uh, this title comes from a play called The Streetcar Named Desire. Has anybody seen A Streetcar Named Desire in here? A few hands, a few hands, a few fellow showmen. I love it. Now, honestly, I haven't watched it. I haven't seen The Streetcar Named Desire. But I did watch the Simpsons episode where they did a streetcar named Desire. Come <laughs> on, somebody. And uh, that was just my life growing up. Australia was a different part of the world. I remember in Australia, as a family, we'd watch the Simpsons before bed. And that's just what we did. And I moved to America where no one liked the Simpsons. I was like, what the heck? But anyway, so I, I watched a streetcar named Desire through the Simpsons. And that's how I got most of my understanding of it. But one of the famous lines of the play A Streetcar Named Desire is at the end, the main character, Blanche Dubois, says that she often relies on the kindness of strangers. That this woman, Blanche, in the play goes through so much pain in her life. She has so much loss. And honestly, throughout the play, you see that her spirit begins to leave her. She begins to give up. And if it isn't for people helping her, then she'd be hopeless in life. In the final song of the play, includes the lyrics, a stranger is just a friend you haven't met. A stranger is just a friend you haven't met. Which actually is quite profound, you know, sentiment when you dig deeper. A friend to you now was at one point a stranger. And conversely, what is a stranger but a potential friend? What's funny is at one point in time, I had no idea who this lady named Aubrey Barnett was. I'd heard of Pastor Tommy Barnett. I'd even heard of Pastor Matthew Barnett because of the Los Angeles Dream Center. Honestly, I hadn't even heard of who Luke Barnett was. And when my dad said that Pastor Barnett would be joining us for dinner, I actually assumed it was Pastor Matthew. I didn't know there was another, another son. I remember going up to uh, Pastor Luke at dinner, not knowing it was him, about to say Pastor Matthew, uh, and when I say it was a pleasure to meet you, and I realized it didn't look like Pastor Matthew, and I just played it safe and said Pastor Barnett. Knowing how competitive my father-in-law is, that was the right move, to not call him after his younger brother. Let me just tell you right now. But at one point, my wife, the love of my life, the woman I care about the most in this entire world, was a stranger. Had I not met her, the friendship I have with her, this marriage that I have, my new family, my son, would have never happened. It's so funny to talk, you know, about life with her, talk about things with her, because honestly, at this point, my life feels like I've always known her. My, my memories have kind of blurred and mixed together to think that she was always there, always a part of my life. Sometimes I'll talk to her and say, isn't it just weird that eight years ago, we didn't know each other, and now we talk to each other while one of us is in the shower and the other one's in the bathroom. Come on, somebody. That's when you know you've made it in marriage, is when one of you can be in the shower or the bathroom and you talk like it's completely normal. The awkwardness of life has completely gone. <laughs> That's how you know you've reached the pinnacle of marriage. Now, this sermon is not about just me embarrassing my wife and talking about our awkward stories, because honestly, we don't have enough time to go through all of them. Let me just tell you right now. But this sermon is about legacy. I would argue that there's no greater legacy that we can leave 
than a legacy of people. People that we've impacted. People we've been a friend towards and shown kindness. People we've led to the Lord. When I analyze the life of Jesus and the legacy he left, there's something so beautiful and profound that often gets swept away in his majesty and miracle working power. You know, Jesus didn't leave a big building. He didn't say, disciples, I'm gonna die, but go to heaven, but don't worry. You're gonna have a giant capital building that you can all party in and live in, and that's how you know I'm king. He didn't say, when I come down, I'm gonna leave you a giant inheritance fund that you can withdraw from and make investments all over the world. The legacy Jesus left is a legacy of people, a legacy of disciples. So point number one this morning is go and make disciples. Point number one, go and make disciples. Uh, we're gonna open up our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, to a little segment called the Great Commission. It'll be on the screen behind me. Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. The last command we see from Jesus in all the Gospels is to make disciples. There's no escaping this fact. Our job is to lead others to relationship and life with Christ. Our job is to lead them to God and also godliness. Jesus says, baptize them, but then he also says, teach them. Oftentimes, a church will highlight one and disregard the other. A church is kind of all about soul winning and doesn't really focus on edifying the person out of sin. Another church cares so much about rules and regulations that they turn every newcomer away because of their sin. See, a lasting legacy needs both salvation and sanctification. It needs baptism and teaching. That's when discipleship happens. Now, Jesus didn't say lead them to a relationship with me, but he exclaimed that we're to disciple people. Now, discipleship begins with relationship with Jesus. But where a decent amount of modern believers get it wrong is they think that their journey ends right there. A lot of believers will kind of be led to this point that their journey through life ends when they find Jesus. We've sometimes heard it said in a church or another setting that your journey's over when you find Christ. Now this is true in the sense of wandering without purpose. Your struggle through life, your feeling of purposelessness and hopelessness and addiction, that will end when you meet Jesus. But the journey to discover who you are and what you're to do is found when you meet Jesus. Friends, when you meet Jesus, that's when the job begins. Our journey through life doesn't end at salvation, that's when it begins. That's when we get to have fun, that's when we get to live out and enjoy the Lord. Is anybody alive this morning at the 9 a.m. service? Come on, let me hear something out there. I know it's early, I know it's cold, but thank goodness we can warm ourselves up this morning. Friends, discipleship is not like school. Discipleship is not meant to be like mandatory classes you have to take to get to be an approved disciple, to get your disciple license. There's no testing in discipleship. Discipleship isn't there to keep us busy like school is. Discipleship is real life. It's fellowshipping with other believers. It's learning about living free while you're living free. You'll know you're in a state of discipleship if you're learning about how to live a free life while simultaneously living a free life. You'll pick up things in life that will help elevate you to a new standard. Friends, Jesus was all about making disciples. He would never command us to do something that he wasn't willing to do or he didn't already do. We see this in Matthew 4, chapter, or Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 22. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him, and going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Friends, Jesus' legacy in life begins right here in Matthew chapter four. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, the first three chapters are about Jesus' birth, escaping King Herod, and focusing on John the Baptist. It's in Matthew four that Jesus begins to leave his legacy. And his legacy begins when he calls Peter. The legacy of Jesus starts in Gospel of Matthew chapter four, when he calls Peter. Friends, Jesus didn't know Peter. He didn't say, and then Jesus saw his childhood friend, Peter, who he used to play football with after school. He didn't see his friend, Peter, who he used to talk about movies with. But it says he saw a man named Peter, and he just said, do you wanna come follow me? 
Friends, Peter was a stranger to Jesus. But also at the same time, Jesus was a stranger to Peter. But Jesus knew that a stranger was just a disciple he hadn't yet met. Peter knew that this stranger named Jesus was a man worth knowing. Friends, how often do we disqualify people from being disciples because they're strange? Because they're strange to us. Because they're strangers. Isn't that what qualifies them? It's so funny, we kind of think that we need to witness just to our friends or people close to us or people of our influence when quite literally the whole point of finding a stranger is because they're estranged in that moment. So often we disqualify the very thing that we're supposed to qualify. The qualification Jesus used for his disciples was he found strangers. What's funny about the life of Jesus, and we see this when he's on the cross, is that the people closest to Jesus, his family, rejected him. We know this is true because when Jesus was being executed, crucified, the only family member present was Mary, his mother. And Jesus turns to his disciple named John and says, John, you now see your mother, and Mary, you now see your son. John, take care of him. That would have been the job of Jesus' brothers. And we know he has James, Joseph, Judas, and even a sister. But yet they weren't present with Jesus. What's funny is the people closest to Jesus were the ones that Jesus decided, the ones that rejected Jesus. Jesus went after the stranger. So often we limit our influence of people and evangelism of others to those we know personally when sometimes there's more power in seeking to spread Jesus to someone who's strange to you. That the real power of Jesus' gospel might not be to the person who's standing right next to you, but the person who you don't even know yet. I see this so powerfully in a, in a story of the life of one of the heroes of our faith. His name is Dr. Cho. This man built the largest church in the world in South Korea. He wasn't born a believer, though. Dr. Cho was actually born into a Buddhist family in Korea during the Korean War. When he was 19, Dr. Cho was diagnosed with a terminal case of tuberculosis. Uh, he just became depressed and isolated. Dr. Cho wasn't a believer at the time. He was a Buddhist. When he got the terminal case of tuberculosis, he disconnected from life and would spend most of his days alone in his house. One day, a Christian missionary, a woman from the USA, was on a mission trip to Korea and visited Dr. Cho's village to spread the gospel. She knocked on all the doors, and eventually she came to Dr. Cho's door, and she knocked on it, and he told her to go away and that he wasn't interested. She tried to persist and speak to him about the gospel, but he refused, and so she went away. So she came back the next day to try and talk to him, but it was the same result. He said, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. Get away from me. I don't care about this. She came back every single day for a week, and finally, Dr. Cho was just so fed up with, with seeing her, he stopped being nice, and when she came back, he began to yell at her, berate her to leave him alone. What's funny is when Dr. Cho began to yell at her, she, she fell down on her knees and she wept aloud. Not because Dr. Cho had yelled and hurt her feelings, but she wept because she so desperately wanted Dr. Cho to allow her to share the gospel with him. She didn't cry because she got her feelings hurt. She cried because she was so desperate for a stranger to know the gospel. She didn't cry because the world was unfair. She cried because she was so desperate for the world to know a fair God. Dr. Cho was so confused. He says, I don't know this woman, and she doesn't know me. But he thought to himself, why does this stranger care so much about me that I'd become a Christian? Dr. Cho says in his, in his testimony, he says, after seeing you cry for me, I'll tell you what, I'll give Christianity a chance. This missionary is overjoyed, and she hands Dr. Cho a Bible and tells him that if he reads it, he will find the words of life. Dr. Cho receives the Bible, and he knows he's dying of tuberculosis, so he just begins to read the Gospel of John and wonders what his life is going to happen. He says, Dr. Cho said this, while he was reading the Gospel of John, the Spirit of the Lord encountered him, and he has a vision of Jesus where Jesus tells him that he's healed of his tuberculosis, and at that moment, Dr. Cho went from deathbed to living his fullest life in the kingdom of God. Because a stranger went out to see a man and spread the gospel, that man had an encounter with a strange God who brought a strange miracle for a strange life. Friends, I've got to tell you, there's a power in going after this stranger in your world. But how often do we limit the stranger? So I don't know him. How can I possibly influence? When the fact that a stranger says, why do you care so much about me? I'll be the very thing that opens his heart to the Lord. It was a stranger who led Dr. Cho to the Lord. 
And Dr. Cho led over one million people to God in South Korea. That's not even a hyperbole. One million souls in South Korea. Yeah, you can get up for Dr. Cho. That's the thing worth clapping about. The fruitfulness of the house of God. South Korea is the only Asian country to be a Christian nation. The only country that is still dominated by Asia that is fully Christian. A legacy was left because of a, a disciple of Jesus decided to preach to a stranger. When that woman goes to heaven, the legacy that she's left is she's gonna look out and see a million souls that Jesus would say, because you preached, these people are in heaven. Now that's a legacy worth having. Friends, knowing a stranger was just a disciple, but we didn't know yet. I think a lot of us in here at some point maybe felt disqualified to be in the house of God. Almost unworthy, undeserving, and perhaps wondering, God, your call for my life has escaped. How many of us are disciples who just didn't know it yet? Who lived a life away from God? Who after encountering God, began to walk with him? But what I love about Jesus is we aren't just merely his disciples. Point number two this morning is more than disciples. Point number two, more than just disciples. In John 15, 15, Jesus says to his disciples, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But Jesus says, I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Friends, there is no other religious text that contains this verse right here. You will not see this verse in Buddhism, Islam, Greek mythology, Taoism, or any other religion where God is friends with his creation. There are examples where God is friendly towards creation. Sure, God can be friendly, but that's because there's a purpose. He, he needs something of them or is rewarding them for their obedience. But only in Jesus do we see that he came to be friends with us. Even when they weren't good friends to him, Jesus was a good friend to them. When Peter would end up denying Jesus, it was Jesus who went out to make it right with Peter. What's funny is Peter has wronged Jesus, yet Jesus decides to make it right with Peter. Now, Jesus didn't go to Peter and say, Peter, you messed up. You hurt my feelings and offended me. Now you need to apologize. He didn't go out with a hit list. He wasn't the offensive bounty hunter. Jesus went out of his own accord to make things right because he was his friend. Jesus never once held it over Peter's head that he was a failure. Jesus didn't tell Peter, you've offended me, now make this right, like we see in people today. Jesus went out of his own way to restore relationship with Peter because that's the legacy Jesus wanted to leave, to leave a lasting legacy of people. That's gonna require that we forgive offenses and choose ourselves to make things right. If you wanna leave a lasting legacy with people, with your family, with friends in this world, you're gonna to have to choose to not be offended. Why do you have to choose to not be offended? Because offended comes easily. My wife can tell me something that's 100% true, but because my wife said it, I'm offended. <laughs> that's just how it is. My wife can say, that's totally true, she's got me pegged, but I say, because it came from you, something about it just ticks me off. <laughs> that's just being humility and honest on the stage. We have to choose to free ourselves from offense. Friends, Jesus chose to leave heaven. He chose to die for us. He chose to spend time with people who he knew would not only betray him, but deny him. Jesus chose to be around Judas, knowing Judas would betray Jesus. Why, why did Jesus do that? Because Jesus knew that's the only way his legacy could be left. If Jesus only came for the perfect people, then there would be no one to save. If Jesus was only gonna witness himself to those who were perfect, to those who deserved it, to those who were qualified, to those who would never offend him, then honestly there would have been no one to witness to. Jesus went out of his way to die in our place so we can be one in righteousness with God. Jesus went out of his way to die in our place so we can be one with righteousness in God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, God made he who knew no sin to become sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who was sinless to become sinful, so we who are sinful can become sinless. Jesus saw his followers not just as pawns to a religious game, not just as earthly peasants, not just as flawed humans, but he saw them as friends. A real legacy of people gets made in your life when you go from seeing others as disciples or subjects 
to friends. Life is better with friends. Friends, your life with Jesus will get better when you begin to see him less as judge, jury, and executioner, but as friend. That's one of the toughest things to swallow as honestly a Bible reading believer because we hear about fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord, don't you have any fear of God? Don't worry about a man who can punish you for a moment, but worry about the God who can judge you for eternity. That brings kind of fear, it brings an awe and a reverence to him. But yet what's crazy is at the same time, Jesus God asks us to call him friend. Why? Because God doesn't want us to only do what he says out of fear, but because we love him. Because if you're operating out of fear, it will only ever last as long as you're afraid. How do we know this? When I'm driving, sometimes I may perhaps lose focus and go a little bit above the speed limit. A little bit. Un poquito above the speed limit. And when I'm driving and I kind of notice I'm above the speed limit, if I see a policeman, I quickly slow down. I say, sir, I was not going a hair over 66 miles an hour. <laughs> Trust me, I was, I was going the absolute speed limit on the freeway. But a lot of us kind of, when we've gone a set distance away from the policeman, well, we might think, well, he's not around anymore. I could probably speed up a little bit. I gotta rush home. I gotta catch the Cardinals game before kickoff. I gotta go bring my canes home before it gets cold. A lot of us, when we no longer fear the judgment, we begin to kind of go back to our old habits. But compare this when my son was born, my Jolie boy, who's a handsome young man. He's about to be a year old, which just makes me feel old, so old. But I remember when, oh, I still remember just being so obsessed with him and carrying him to the car the very first time he was in our car, we're going home. And literally the speed limit on the freeway is 65. I was going like 55. <laughs> I was that annoying person in like the far right lane. Like I am not going a second over this speed. Every little speed bump, I was slowing down and going over it so slowly. Why? because I love my son. I loved my son. There wasn't anything I wouldn't do for my son to keep him safe, healthy, and, and just free in this world. As I was in the mindset of operating a fear of punishment, I was only doing what was right as long as that fear was there. When I was operating out of love for my son, I, I operate in that as continually as my love is there, which will never end. Friends, the reason why God asks you to call him friend and, and father is because he wants you to do what he says, not because you're afraid of him, because you truly love him. Because you truly will say, God, this is what I want to do in life. This is what I want to do. Now, it's not a sin to have the fear of the Lord because the biblical word fear of the Lord means reverence. It means awesome. It means you're not comfortable with God. The moment you get comfortable with God is the moment you feel like it's okay to sin. That's why Paul says, you know, you can't use grace and freedom as just an excuse to sin, knowing God will forgive you. That's when you get comfortable. That's when you love someone, you don't ever wanna get comfortable with them. My wife says all the time, she says, you haven't told me I'm beautiful. I said, I told you yesterday. She said, I know, that was yesterday. And I'm like, what the? <laughs> I'm like, every single day. She's like, yeah, I have to continually love and, and, and impress my wife every single day. Not that it's a problem, but I can't ever get comfortable with her. It's the moments that I get comfortable or laxed or careless or the moments that our relationship, the embers begin to kind of fizzle out. It's like there's a very... Uh, famous story on Australian news where this Australian man was at counseling and his, and his wife was like, they were just in a really rough spot. And so I was like, my husband is just one of the coldest people. He hasn't told me he loves me in 20 years. We've been married 20 years, hasn't told me in 20 years that he loves me, hasn't told me I'm beautiful, hasn't told me I'm pretty. And the therapist said, is this true? Have you not said this? He says, well, yeah. I told her on my wedding day and if I change my mind, I'll let her know. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> now, that's one of the worst things you can possibly do in a relationship. You have to constantly reinsure and reinforce my feelings for my bride. And not that it's some, you know, bottle with a hole at the bottom that trickles out. That's just how God made us. We can never get comfortable. When you get comfortable with people you love, that's when you begin to get careless and sloppy. And that's why Jesus says, look to me as friend. Look to me as someone you'd be willing to do anything for. Because friends, our life with Jesus gets better when we begin to see him less as judge, but as friend. When we do things for Jesus out of love, even our mistakes can bring him glory. Point number three, a failure is just a victory yet to come. Point number three, a failure is just a victory yet to come. What's beautiful about Jesus is when you're walking hand in hand with Jesus, even your mistakes can bring him glory. 
Even your traumas, your wounds, your pains can be used to bring Jesus Christ glory and can bring healing to other people. In Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things work together for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for those who love God, for those who do what God asks of them. Paul is saying this to a Roman church during a time of intense persecution. The Romans were not friends to Christians. Romans would grab Christians from their churches, from their homes, put them on, they'd hang them to death, put them on poles, cover them in tar and light them on fire as streetlights. They would take them from their homes and put them in the gladiator games and have lions rip them to shreds for entertainment. The Roman church was hostile to, or the Roman government was hostile to the church. And Paul says, God can use everything for good. In the heat of a negative moment, in the heat of being a failure, or having doubts, or having problems, it can work out. Because when we trust in God, we realize we can't do it. We open the full window for him to do it. Friends, even though today may look like a failure, tomorrow that failure can turn to success. When we fully believe Romans 8, 28 with all of our heart, that's when we can leave the greatest legacy. And friends, honestly, there's no greater legacy that can be left when a failure turns into a victory. It becomes not only a rally cry for other believers, but creates a larger window for God to move in his power. We see this in the life of a hero named Charles Finney. Charles Finney is an exceptional man of God. He was a preacher of the gospel who, who led America in its second great awakening in the 1800s. Early on in his ministry, he was blessed with tremendous success in the Holy Ghost. Everywhere he would go, thousands of people would get saved and the power of the Holy Ghost would be released. People were being set free from, he or from disease and sickness, demons, possession was going away. Then one day, the pastor of a church in Evan Mills, New York, asked if Reverend Charles Finney could do a revival for his church because the people were so hard-hearted and stubborn. Now, Charles Finney would preach on Sundays all day, then he'd do Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night services. But every single time he was preaching at this revival, the congregation would refuse to respond to his altar call. And night after night, they would not accept Christ as their savior. One of the Wednesday evening sermons, Charles Finney eventually gave an altar call where he said this famous line. He said, now I must know your minds. And I want all of you who will give your pledge to make peace with God immediately to stand up. And all of you who resolve not to become Christians and wish me to understand and Christ to understand, Stay seated. He says, if you want to know Christ, stand to your feet right now. But if you want to deny Christ, stay seated. The entire congregation remained in their seats and not one person stood up for the Lord. Not one person responded to say, yeah, I'm gonna be a disciple of Jesus. At first, Charles Finney thought he was devastated. He thought he'd failed God. He said, God, I, I came in here with an assignment to win this people back to you, and I've clearly failed. Not a single soul has been won. Charles Finney said these final words before dismissing that service. He told the people, for as long as you live, you've publicly committed yourself against Jesus. He dismissed the service, and he walked off the platform and probably just began to meditate to himself. Some of the congregants of that service walked away angry, others sad, and a lot of them just confused. Charles Finney was kind of moping to himself when a deacon of the church, God bless the deacons, he said this famous line, he said, Brother Finney, that was one of the best altar calls I've ever seen. He says, you have these people right where God wants them because they can't rest with what just happened in their minds. The next day, Charles Finney went to the service tent to preach, low expectations, and he saw that it was not only packed, but there were people lined up outside the tent, desperate to repent before God. Charles Finney got up and preached how he normally did. Everything in the service was normal, except he didn't do an altar call. After he, pre after he was done preaching, he just dismissed the service and he walked away. He didn't even give an altar call. It wasn't for a few steps that he took before people were begging him not to leave and lead them in the sinner's prayer. But Charles knew that the Spirit of God 
could convict them more than he could. And he walked away. He walked out and he stood back and was amazed that not one person in that whole service left. And they were all crying out to God and repenting for not standing for him when they had the chance. What I love about this story is what looked like Charles Finney's greatest failure ever. He'd worked on this whole congregation for weeks and at one moment looked like he had zero people won to go. In a moment what looked like his greatest failure of an altar call ended up being the foundation for the greatest revival that church has ever seen. One of the greatest revivals the state of New York has ever seen. You can give it up for Pastor Charles Finney. He's in heaven right now. Because Charles Finney knew that revival didn't come because of his anointing and success, but his willingness to fail and let God do the rest. Do you have that this morning? Do you have a willingness to fail in certain areas because that's the only way God can actually move through you? A willingness to finally let something go. That's why Jesus says in John 12, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus says, unless you're willing to sometimes let go of our ego, our pride, what we think is best, and we just allow God to move, even though it hurts or seems wild or seems unusual, that's when we see results. Friends, when you apologize, even when it's not your fault, when you buy your wife flowers when she's having her worst day and doesn't necessarily deserve them, when you're willing to give away money that you desperately need, moments that seem so strange to you, moments that seem so foreign, so out of pocket, moments that seem like giving up or losing, those are the moments where you allow God to do something you've never seen. I'm gonna close with the story of a man named John Wesley who's quite literally one of the greatest people ever. He's a hero of mine. When John Wesley went on his first crusade to America, John Wesley was convinced he was a man of complete faith. He says, I'm going to bring, he lived before Charles Finney, he says, I'm gonna bring revival to America. I'm gonna carry the gift of God and bring revival to America. John Wesley went to America and after one month he left because no one would come to hear him preach. He was the man who lit England on fire and he went to America and didn't work out. He initially returned home feeling like a failure, that it wasn't good enough. But John Wesley began to think and he, he said, oh, that's right. He says, I'm not good enough. Jesus is. John Wesley grew up kind of rich. He, he grew up in the elite part of town and he kind of figured that his status would be what brought people to Christ. John Wesley returned home to England and immediately revamped his entire ministry technique. He no longer wanted to use his notoriety to attract people to him, but he wanted to bring all of his money and spend all of his money so he could bring himself to the people. John Wesley went on the offensive and not the defensive. At that point in time, the only people that wanted to hear what John Wesley had to say were the poor, the prisoners, the enslaved. At first, when he preached to them, they would kind of ridicule him and ignore him, saying, how could you possibly relate to us? You, you grew up rich, you grew up educated, you grew up with all these things. How do you know what it's like? And they even sometimes would beat him and reject him. The story in the life of John Wesley was one time he was preaching to a group of ex-prisoners and one of them picked up a rock and bashed John Wesley over the head with it. John Wesley got up and rather than attacking this man or running away, he kept preaching to him the free gift of God and the salvation of Christ. That man was so shocked that a rich man, an elite, a stranger would be willing to do something like that for him. He said, because the stranger who I don't know was willing to do these crazy things, maybe I should just listen to him. John Wesley started with the ones nobody wanted and eventually his ministry was filled with people that everybody wanted. When John Wesley left America, people would have called him a failure, that he wasn't enough. But that failure was just a victory yet to come since it taught him the valuable lesson on how he could succeed. But the only time we truly fail is when we don't learn from our mistakes. It was in his writings that John Wesley said one of the most profound statements of ministry. John Wesley said, if you're willing to light yourself on fire with passion for Christ 
People will come for miles just to watch you burn. He says, if you're willing to just light yourself on fire for Jesus, if you're willing to do a crazy thing at a crazy time in a crazy place for God, people will come everywhere just to watch what you've got. That's not the words of a failure or someone who is dependent on his ego. Those are the words of a man who realized in his failure that it's not about him, but it's about Jesus. And friends, that principle is still true today. Just because you failed doesn't mean you've lost or that you are a failure. It just means that you have a victory that still is yet to come. Just as much as a stranger is a friend you haven't met, a failure, if I'm being honest with you, is a victory you just haven't met. A victory that's still yet to come. A promise that's still yet to be fulfilled. A promise that you need to still cling to. But how often do we just give up at the first sign of failure? And so I guess this thing's not worth having. When I look at the cross today, I don't see a sign of failure. But I see the cross as a sign of victory. For everyone who believes and looks unto the cross, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up a bronze serpent, so a man will be lifted up on a cross, and all who look at it will be saved. The cross isn't a sign of failure, but a sign of victory. What once was a symbol of capital punishment for the worst of sinners is now a symbol of hope for everyone. That no matter how hard today is, how badly you messed up yesterday, there's joy in the morning. There's hope in what tomorrow can bring. For three days, the devil thought he won. For three days, the cross looked like a failure and a mark against the church, a mark against those who believe, saying, look what happened, you who believed, you lost. For three days of all humanity, of all eternity, the cross could have been seen as a symbol of defeat. But after three days, a man named Jesus Christ rose from the dead, defeating death. And that cross is now a symbol of victory for all believers. Friends, do you believe that this morning? Do you believe in the power of the cross of, of God? Oh, friends, let's just give up a big praise to God right now. Give up a big praise to God. We can never forget that church is a place to just embrace God. Yes, we have great worship and powerful moves and, 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 and pieces of art. But above all else, do we just come and say, God, you are so good. Jesus left a legacy that we can all be a part of because he was willing to die for people he hadn't yet met. People Jesus loved as friends. Jesus fully lived with this idea that a stranger was just a friend he hadn't yet met because he died for a world full of strangers in order that they could all become friends one day. He was even willing, Jesus was gonna go through such suffering and pain and what appeared to be failure so that we might find victory. Friends, it's never too late to find the victory of Jesus. If I could have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes this morning. There, there are two types of people in here. The first type, you've, you've been wandering a long time in this world, wondering what you're called to do, where you're called to go. You've been on a journey You've had struggle and pain and aches and sorrows and regrets. And you're wondering, is there a plan for me? Is there a purpose for me? Is there something greater than myself? I've got to tell you this morning, there's a man named Jesus. And if you give him a chance and let him be your Lord and guide you through this life and surrender yourself to him, not only would your pain end, but your joy would begin. The struggle of not knowing what to do would end and, and the joy of walking in your fulfillment would begin. And then there are those in here who you've known Jesus, but you've been marked by failure, marked with sexual failure, a regret that you have so badly that you wish you could get away, marked with a failure in the marketplace thought you had this bright idea that would bring healing and hope and, and even prosperity to your world, but yet it came crashing down. Or maybe you're in here and you need a touch of God because the world has spoken a word over you, a word of death, a word of sickness, a word of problem, a word of ache. You're saying, I need some of that victory this morning. Friends, if you're in one of those two camps, 
need to, I need to get close to God. I'm just far from God. I wanna realign myself with God for the first time or the first time in a long time. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you this morning, on the count of three, could you lift up your hand so I could pray with you and pray for you that you might be realigned to Christ? On the count of three, one, two, three. Lift up those hands, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see that hand. Thank you, thank you. I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you at the back, I see that hand. Thank you right there. Thank you right there, I see that hand. Thank you over here. Thank you right there. I see that. Thank you. I see that. Thank you. Thank you. I see. Man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you up there. I see that hand. Thank you back there. I see that hand. Thank you up on the balcony. I see those hands. God bless you up there. I see those hands. God bless you. Thank you. I see that hand, sir. God bless you. You can put your hands down. If everybody could repeat after me before I pray over you, everybody, we're going to go over what's called the prayer of redemption. Because although we were sinners, we've now been redeemed by the blood of God. If everybody could repeat after me and say, Dear Jesus, thank you for saving me, a stranger who you didn't even know. Lord Jesus, today, I choose to make you my Lord and my Savior and my friend. Lord Jesus, today, I love you for all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen. Amen. Oh, come on.